my pleasure to introduce uh, Barbara, who is uh, who holds the chair of molecular psychiatry at Radbu uh, University uh, in the Netherlands, and uh, who has uh, uh, chaired the uh, ADHD work group. And she's going to talk a little bit about uh, what's been going on uh, there. So Barbara, you talk. Turn Thank it over you, Jordan. To you. Thanks for inviting me to, to give this talk on behalf of the PGC ADHD Working Group, which I co-chair co together with, the, uh, with Ben Neal. Um, well, this is the wrong way, I'm sorry. Let's start again. I want to, to show you a few things. Uh, let me start by saying that ADHD is one of the most frequent um, psychiatric disorders that we know of. Um, its frequency is high in children. This is a large study uh, looking into 102 different studies from around the world, finding a, pre a prevalence of about 5% in children, but also in adults, and that is less known. ADHD is highly frequent with a, a prevalence of 2 to 3% uh, worldwide. In addition to the appearing um, symptoms that, that are the core of ADHD, uh, uh, ADHD is made worse by the fact that it is comorbid with many other psychiatric disorders and up to 85% of cases with ADHD have at least one additional uh, uh, psychiatric uh, diagnosis. In addition, about 70% seven, uh, of the cases have cognitive deficits and what is more and more clear is that ADHD also goes along with comorbidity uh, in, in the uh, non-brain uh, areas, like, for example, obesity, diabetes mellitus, cardiovascular diseases, autoimmune diseases, but also dementias, as we now begin to realize. So with, with ADHD and uh, PGC, in comparison with many of the adult disorders, we were a little bit slower in getting to, um, to the first genome-wide significant findings. And it actually took both P PGC and iPsych uh, to work together to get to a sample size that gave us enough power to find significant uh, loci for ADHD. Um, when the paper came out uh, in uh, 2019, it, it really was a game changer for our field. And I want to take you along a few other, a uh, few of the findings that I find particularly interesting in terms of the genetic, in terms of the infrastructure or the genetic architecture of ADHD. So one of the things that uh, this study told us was that ADHD is actually uh, continuous with ADHD symptoms in the general population where it comes to common genetic uh, variation. And the genetic correlation between ADHD as a clinical category and ADHD symptoms in the general population turned out to be, be really, really high with over 90%. So essentially what we're seeing in, uh, in the clinical disorder is an accumulation of genetic variants that also contributes to symptoms in, um, in the general population. Another thing that was important was that um, ADHD, the, the comorbidity that we see uh, for ADHD with psychiatric disorders is reflected by genetic overlap. And this is actually a, a figure from the Post Disorder Working Group paper of PGC that came out in Cell in, at the end of 2019. ADHD shows significant correlation with, uh, with virtually all the disorders that, um, that were being studied, OCD being the exception, but that could be a power issue. But in terms uh, of genetic overlap, it doesn't stop at psychiatric disorders. Um, also in the somatic disorders, um, we see that the comorbidity at the phenotypic level is accompanied by genetic overlap. And this is, for example, clear for, for the uh, uh, disorders that are related to body mass index, but also extends to things like rheumatoid arthritis that essentially I think nobody had looked at before. So um, in terms of, of looking at new work from our working group that I want to go through, uh, through with you, 
there are a number of issues that we are working on that come from this initial uh, findings. And one is the GWAS of ADHD symptoms in the general population. So we've seen this continuum um, between the uh, population and the clinical extreme. Um, and we can use that to see whether we, we, uh, we find genetic factors that contribute to ADHD symptomatology in the general population. Another thing that we're working on that, that can help us is uh, the cross disorder GWAS of ADHD with somatic disorders, and I'll come to one that is on obesity and BMI. I also want to touch shortly on a paper um, that has recently come out on adult ADHD in comparison to childhood findings, and then a small sneak preview on the new uh, GWAS for ADHD that we're putting together right now. So the first one is uh, work from, um, from Tatiana Sayats and co-workers on a GWAS meta-analysis of ADHD symptoms in children from the general population. And they uh, put together a whole set of data sets um, um, amounting to a data on uh, over 41,000 people for both domains that are core to ADHD, the inattention, and the hyperactivity impuls impulsivity. If we look at the findings from this um, GWAS meta-analysis, and we don't uh, have um, genome-wide significant findings yet, but we do see some things that seem to be more related to uh, one domain than to the other. We find heritability in both uh, domains, though not so high as for the clinical extreme. And, um, we find that both domains are highly uh, genetically correlated to, um, to the ADHD diagnosis and uh, show moderate to high uh, genetic correlation amongst the two symptom domains of ADHD. When we look at, um, uh, at the, the correlations uh, with other um, uh, traits and, uh, and disorders, uh, between the two domains, we see differences, potential differences at least, and none of what you here see uh, reaches, genome, uh, reaches significance yet after multiple testing, but it is quite interesting to see that, um, that probably uh, inattention is more related than hyperactivity, impulsivity to intelligence and, and um, uh, uh, schooling, for example, success in, in reaching degrees. So these studies in the general population offer us the opportunity to potentially find uh, uh, the differential effects on individual symptom of individual symptom domains when it comes to uh, relation to other traits. And one thing in which uh, this could be interesting is also in terms of pharmacogenetics. And what you see here is a quite complicated scheme in which Tatiana put together all the target genes for certain um, uh, uh, drugs that are used for the treatment of ADHD and looked at genes um, or looked at association findings uh, from her GWAS in a gene-based manner. And what you see, for example, is that uh, HDR7, the serotonin uh, receptor 7, um, uh, is more um, associated with hyperactivity, impulsivity, than it is to inattention, whereas uh, OPR1 seems to play a larger role in inattention than it does in hyperactivity impulsivity. So that's quite interesting. And we're looking forward to this paper being uh, prepared by Tatiana and her co-workers. Another uh, uh, recent work is on uh, a GWAS of ADHD and obesity. Um, I should just showed you this with this um, genetic correlation to all these body mass index related um, data. And Nina uh, Rodmota, as part of an EU project called COCA on ADHD comorbidity, has looked into that and she did a cross disorder GWAS of ADHD plus BMI and ADHD plus obesity. And the, the uh, major uh, uh, um, contribution. In, these, in this cross disorder, GWAS, <clears throat> to these two uh, disorders was from dopamine signaling. So that's quite interesting uh, 
in light of the fact that we know from uh, studies on ADHD that there is this association with, uh, uh, with obesity, but when people are treated for their ADHD, actually the odds ratio goes back to, to one and there is no increased risk. So in this way, these um, cross disorder GWAS can help us to identify principal biological pathways that may be most in, uh, important in, um, in identifying routes to, uh, to therapy for these comorbidities. The third study that I want to short, shortly show you is um, something that is quite, quite specific to ADHD, which is the fact that ADHD remits in part of the, uh, the cases. So what you see here is a meta-analysis of, of Steve Perone um, from a number of years ago, where he showed that um, if you look at longitudinal follow-up of uh, people with ADHD, and uh, many of them lose their, um, their diagnosis in adulthood, but, but uh, many also uh, keep impairing symptoms and functional impairment. But some of them lose it. Um, so it may be important to identify those that are um, uh, perhaps in greatest need of treatment uh, because they are on the path to a persistent uh, form of ADHD. And we did a first analysis as part of the impact uh, uh, group together with IPSAC and PGC, which just came out early in April in neuropsychopharmacology, a GWAS meta-analysis of, of ADHD in adults, a, um, adults with persistent forms of ADHD and a comparison with childhood ADHD. And this took data from uh, PGC and IPSAC as well as uh, uh, the impact group uh, and did a GWAS on, on the persistent ADHD in comparison to the childhood ADHD. We find a high correlation of 81% uh, between um, the genetics of adult ADHD and childhood ADHD. Uh, this is significantly different from zero, but is also significantly different from one, which is interesting in the light of the fact that uh, twin studies have shown us earlier on that uh, the, the contribution to the onset of ADHD may not be the same as the uh, contribution to uh, the persistence of ADHD over time. So by identifying differential genetic contributions to ADHD onset and ADHD persistence, we could uh, help predict prognosis of a patient and could help prioritize patients for treatment. Last but not least, I promised a, a preview of the new GWAS of ADHD and Dita de Montes has worked on that uh, in the last uh, year, putting together a panel of uh, 118,000 cases and over um, nearly 900,000 controls based on IPSYC uh, 1 and 2, so a second wave of IPSYC data, as well as 23andMe data. And they identified uh, 85 independent genome-wide significant findings where um, the, the, uh, a comparison to the ones that uh, came out of the first uh, GWAS with the 12 significant loci showed that most of them are, um, uh, are um, uh, replicated here. In terms of, of looking at genetic correlations with other phenotypes among these data, and a lot of, uh, of the things that we saw in the earlier GWAS are replicated here as well. There are a number of additional findings that came out, like for example here, uh, a genetic correlation with site rate, um, which means that, that potentially there is something going on with the um, uh, basic energy metabolism of, um, of the cells in people with ADHD. Um, so this is, is really, really promising, very, really exciting. And we are now adding additional data sets from PGC and uh, doing more analysis before this will be published, hopefully um, early next year, I hope. So this is a number of things um, for the ADHD working group. If you're interested uh, in more detail, um, Ditte and Tatiana gave a worldwide lab last uh, Friday, so you find more information there. And the other two papers have just been published in neuropsychopharmacology. So thanks for your attention. <laughs>
Well, Terrific. Thank you, Barbara. Um, so we have a couple of minutes for questions because we're running a little bit up against the clock. Uh, are there any questions people want to put into the Q&A box? Give it a moment here. So can I ask a question while we're waiting? So it, it, it does seem that ADHD has the broadest broadest range of strong genetic correlations of with other comorbid traits. Um, and it, yeah. and those, those are truly diverse. Um, what are the implications for that as in, in our thinking? I mean, some clinicians I've talked to think, say that they're thinking about ADHD more as a syndrome than as a disorder, as it were. Yeah, I, I'm... It's, I think it's a, it's a difficult problem that we're looking at. Also very, very interesting. If you look at, uh, at these genetic correlations, you find that really also in terms of, of uh, personal success, et cetera, ADHD symptoms or ADHD genetic contribution seems to be in, play an important role. So um, a lot of thinking goes into that. How can that be? Um, and I think it is that the behaviors that we see in ADHD are very, very basic behaviors that contribute to a lot of, um, uh, of diagnosis and also to, to behavior um, in the normal range. So I think it's, it's, this is a, uh, an area where we should look deeper into thinking that ADHD is a risk factor for many, many different disorders, di different behaviors. Barbara, we have two questions uh, and maybe we'll have to just limit it to these two because of the interest of time, but let me just quickly uh, pose them to you. One of them has to do with whether, uh, what do we know about whether higher genetic load for AGHD predicts a uh, response to treatment? For example, polygenic oh. risk, et cetera. Um, hmm. I don't think that this is really the case. Um, so we see that, that in general, uh, uh, treatment success is very high in ADHD. About 70% of the people has a good uh, uh, response to the to stimulants or non-stimulant treatments. Um, and there aren't yet any strong findings in terms of pharmacogenetics. I'm, I haven't seen data uh, looking at the load, actually. Okay, great. Um... And uh, just lastly, uh, from Ed Cook, how, how might the absence of population ascertainment impact results like the possible effect of socioeconomic status on genetic correlations? If at all, do we know anything about that? Mm, I think it's an interesting question, but I don't know. No. <laughs> 